Cool. Hi everyone. Um, welcome along today. Um, we will get straight into it. Um, I'm Nicole Lang. I'm the facilitator for the Central Canterbury Farming for Profit group. Um, obviously tonight's webinar is focused on worming. Um, we will drive in whatever direction um, those attendees do want to go. So, um, so yeah, we'll get straight into it. So um, I'm supported tonight, obviously, by Briar Huggett, who is the uh, Beef and Lamb Extension Manager for the Northern South Island. She's working on the functionality in the background, hiding away. So um, thanks, Briar, for um, coming along. And also we've got Dr. Cara Brosnahan from Beef and Lamb. She's the Senior Advisor for Research Programs. She'll do the second part of the presentation on um, a bit of an update on where the research is. Um, and then obviously we've got Ginny Dodansky from Totally Vets um, and she's our Wimwise facilitator. So welcome Ginny, thanks for coming along. Thanks Nicole um, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, this is an unusual format for me to try and do uh, what would normally be a, a Wimwise presentation or workshop of some sort, um, but we will just crack straight into it. Um, the brief I was given was very much around uh, drench use, um, monitoring and, and drench products. Um, and there is obviously a massive chunk um, of management stuff in around the whole topic of worm management. But because we've only got a short time tonight, I am going to try and stick to the brief. Okay, so this, the topic tonight is very much on um, understanding drenches and drench resistance. I'm sure that most of you have probably seen some version of this diagram before, so I'm not gonna labor the point um, about the life cycle of worms in sheep and cattle. Um, the main points uh, from this slide, however, are that at any one time, around about 5% of the total population of worms on your farm is actually in your animals. Um, the vast majority of the life cycle stages um, are life cycle stages that are out on the pasture. Um, so that's either um, eggs that have passed out of the feces and being aware that eggs in the feces are also uh, ones that have been laid um, by the worms and are still passing out of the animal. Um, and that becomes very relevant when we're talking about um, something like quarantine drenching, which we may get to later. Um, the, you know, then you've got these, the, the egg hatch, some of the eggs hatch. Um, that's a, a whole topic in itself as to the hatchability of eggs, depending on what animal they've come out of, what, what age of animal, um, immune status of animal that they've come out of. Um, and then a number of them develop through to larvae um, in the grass. It's the L3 larval stage um, that the animals ingest um, once they've crawled up the grass blades and um, making the point very strongly, um, I'll just flip through that one, um, that with respect to those grass blades, um, the vast majority of the larvae that your animals consume um, are down in that bottom two and a half centimetres of pasture, right? So um, that becomes relevant when you're thinking about grazing management. Um, I'm just going to go back very quickly because I can't talk about worms uh, without talking about this concept and, and getting through the fact that um, even though we're here tonight to, to talk about drenches and drenching, um, that any time and any place in your farm system that you can generate feed that has a low level of that worm larval challenge on it, you will always be better off um, than regular drenching. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the bottom of this slide or not, um, but these were lambs um, at Lincoln University. This work was done. Um, they were either um, on a completely worm-free diet, which is that top uh, light green line. Um, the next group of lambs, um, they, these worms started with, uh, these lambs, sorry, started with no worms in them at all. Um, that second line down is lambs that were receiving 5,000 larvae a day and five, th I mean, sorry, 1,000 larvae a day. That sounds like a lot of larvae. Um, but on some of your heavily contaminated um, sheep dominant hill country pastures, your lambs might be taking in 20,000 larvae a day. Um, and then these two lines down here are interesting because both of these groups received 5,000 larvae a day, right? So a steady daily infection of larvae to kind of mimic what they might be grazing off the pasture. 
Um, the bottom line um, is lambs that receive no drench whatsoever. At the end of 14 weeks, um, these lambs had put on eight kilos, right? So these are parasitized lambs with no drench as compared to completely unparasitized lambs and lambs only getting a few larvae. The middle line is lambs that were drenched every 21 days. So that's a suppressive drench. Um, just going back, um, the life cycle, the, the fastest that this life cycle can go from an egg passing out of the sheep to um, being in, going through the larval development on pasture, being ingested by the sheep and then into another egg laying adult that can keep this cycle going. The fastest that cycle can go is 21 days. So every 21 days, the adult um, worms were getting knocked out of these lambs and it was, an, it was a fully effective drench. They weren't leaving um, worms behind. So the point from this graph is that that regular suppressive 21 day drenching is only making up half of the live weight gain that would be available to these lambs if they were eating a low worm diet. And that, that's the key message um, when it comes to managing lambs. Um, you know, you can do all the drenching in the world, but you're never going to make up um, the advantage that you would have um, if you were providing um, a low contamination feed. So new grass, um, chicories, plantains, red clovers, um, all those sorts of things, they will have some worm larvae on them. Um, but the difference between that and a heavily contaminated hill country pasture is, is massive. Um, and you won't get around it just by regularly drenching if they're on contaminated pasture. So I'm sorry to labour that point. I'm sure a lot of you have seen that before, but I have to say it um, because we're now going to go on and talk only about drenching. <laughs> but I just want you to, if you take one thing away from tonight, it is this, um, that no amount of drenching is going to make up for um, both good low contamination pasture and um, being able to, to keep your animals, those animals in their critical um, production phases like um, ewes at the moment in those last few weeks pre-lamb um, and lambs that you're trying to grow really fast and calves that you're trying to grow really fast, the more that you can graze up into that upper part of the sward and not make the meat down here where all these larvae are, that's going to help as well. So moving on. Okay, drench, woohoo, win a trip to the moon. Half the things in my kitchen came from a drench company, right? And I'm sure you're all the same. Um, just, I, I understand that the North Canterbury group, that um, you've got a lot of younger farmers in your group. Um, and a lot of you, and certainly I wasn't born back here uh, when the white drenches were first released. Um, so the first drenches that ever came on the market were white drenches. Anything with a endazole in the end of its name, like oxfendazole, fenbendazole, anything endazole is a white drench. Um, and they were released in the 60s and they revolutionised sheep production and made farmers realise, um, you know, how much they were losing through worms. Um, and so regular drenching with, with um, BZ white drenches became the norm. Um, in the early 70s um, in New Zealand, um, nilworm, levamazole came on the market. Um, so those, those are the two earliest um, drenched chemicals. They're, they're completely different in the way that they act on the worm and in the way that uh, resistance is inherited to those drenches. Um, we then went another kind of decade or so, and then in the early 80s was the release of ivermectin. And ivermectin is a member of the mectin family, and anything with ectin on the end of it is the same family. Ivermectin is the least potent of those drenches, um, meaning that it will be often the first one to show up drench resistance, whereas um, an abamectin, um, like is what in most of your triple combinations, moxidectin, which is your cytectin, vetdectin, and then you've got doramectin and aprinamectin and, and several other mectins that get used in cattle and deer. Um, but ivermectin was the original and it is the least potent, but um, resistance to all of those is inherited in that virtually the same way. Um, and once you've got resistance to ivermectin, you are on some sort of a slope um, to getting resistance to these other ones. Then we were blindsided in the early 
2020s um, by the release after us vets telling you for decades that there's never going to be any new drenches on the market. And we suddenly got blindsided by the release of both um, StarTect, which is DeQuantil, um, and Zolvix, which is Monipantil. Um, so they've been very useful having these new actives, but we've got to be really, really careful using them. Um, and I'll go into that a bit more in a minute. But they, these are the basic drench families. So I hope that has helped. And I've already, yeah, I've already alluded to this. Um, well, no, I haven't, sorry, this is the next slide. Um, so you've got resistance when a population of worms that was previously susceptible to a drench um, is now able to survive it. That is different from inefficacy, where the worms were never really killed that well in the first place. A really good example of inefficacy is um, levamazole and deer. Levamazole's never been any good at uh, removing worms from deer, even at high dose rates. And if you push the dose rate of levamazole too much, you'll kill them anyway. Um, so that's, that's an efficacy where the, where the product never worked in the first place, whereas resistance is where it used to work and bit by bit, um, genetically, the worms develop resistance to it. And um, now we've got a population of worms where the drench um, doesn't work anymore. And I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. So here we go. Um, yeah, so drench resistance is a change in the genes or the DNA of the worms. And the change in that DNA will alter structure or function um, in those worms that enables them to survive um, the drenched chemicals. Um, and to start with, those are just random mutations in the population, um, and it might be one worm in a million. When we first started using um, thiobendazole in the 60s, there was one worm in a million or one worm in several million that for whatever reason had, had genes or structure or chemical processes that um, enabled it to already survive thiobendazole. So some of the things can be uh, mechanisms for pumping the drug out faster before the worm is killed by the drug, um, changes of metabolic pathways in the worms um, so that they say metabolize the drug faster before it kills them, um, or altered chemical systems in the worm um, that mean that they are no longer susceptible to whatever process um, that drench uses to kill them. Um, so those are some of the things that change. Um, and these genetic changes, um, I'm not going to go into the detail, um, but they are unique to each worm species and also for each um, drug family. Um, so I'll give you one example um, would be that um, in Ostertagia, which is the sm uh, small brown stomach worm in, in sheep, um, that predominates in the pre lamb period, to keep that in your mind. Um, so resistance in Ostertagia is inherited to, to, to the Mecton family, um, is inherited in a dominant fashion. So a worm only needs to have one copy of, of the resistance gene um, to be resistant itself. Um, and the other thing about Ostertagia is that um, within the sheep, um, the incoming Ostertagia larvae actually are very good at knocking out the adult worms that are there. So if you've got a product in your, in your use pre lamb that's got a mectin in it, and there's a lot of Ostertagia around, um, the resistant ones only need one copy of the gene, not two, um, and the incoming larvae um, can knock the adults out. So you can see how quickly in that example um, resistance can develop. Um, I won't go into any more detail about different worms and resistance because I'll bore you to death, um, but it's just being aware that it is different between the different species and it does vary with the different drugs. And we don't necessarily understand with every drug and every worm exactly how it works, but scientists have worked it out for a number of them. Another interesting one, sorry, just before I move on, would be Barber's Pole. Um, Barber's Pole worm in the North Island and the top of your South Island. Um, the resistance genes in that seem to be recessive for most chemicals. So it does seem to take a long time um, to develop resistance, which thank goodness for that, right? Okay, and I've already made the point here, um, when resistance is present within one action family, i.e. the mectins, it will eventually develop to all the other members of that family. Um, and making the point there, ivermectin in red is the least potent of the mectins. It's not on the market on its own anymore. The only product that you'll find that in now is ivermatrix. Um, and that's got ivermectin in it because ivermectin is very, very safe. Um, so it's better for young lambs and young calves than something with ivermectin in it. So what? 
who cares? Um, does it matter that I'm using an ineffective drench if when I drench, um, most of the lambs clean up and nothing dies and they seem to be growing? Um, Ag research looked at this um, back after StarTech and Zolvix were released because they were able to use a product that was completely effective uh, to which there was no known resistance. Um, so this was a comparison between using um, Zolvix for a regular lamb drench and a, a BZ drench that had become 50% effective um, on one of the Ag research blocks. So lambs were weaned, they were given regular 28 day drenches with either product um, and then their productivity was measured um, until the end of the autumn. Okay, so the lambs that were treated with the 50% effective BZ drench um, reached a weight where they, where they would normally be drafted um, four to six weeks later than the lambs that were being drenched with the effective Zolvix. That's a shitload of uh, autumn grass um, that could be going into your ewes or being used to build cover. And by the end of the autumn, these lambs were nine kilos lighter or 4.7 kilos of carcass weight lighter um, than their compatriots that had been getting a fully effective drench. The lambs in that faded photo and behind, they are the 50% effective group. Um, in the autumn, look at the feed they're on, beautiful long green grass. You can see some daggy bums, but look at the feed they're on. Um, that lamb in the front, he's got a beautiful round bum, full gut, looks great. Um, the one with his backside to us, same thing. Would you know, eyeballing that group of lambs, there's one there who maybe is a little bit light across the back, um, but just eyeballing that group of lambs, ignoring the dags, you know, would you know that they'd gone all that time being drenched with something that was only removing half the worms um, and you know you can see that the productivity cost of doing that and I can hear you all thinking well who cares that's not me. Um, in the North Island now um, in, the, in the district I work in and plenty of other vets I talk to we are regularly finding um, farms where the, the double combinations and even the triple combination are getting down into these really poor levels of efficacy and, and in fact on, on many, not many farms, but on enough farms to be a concern, um, these drenches are actually failing completely. Um, and on nearly all of them, people had no idea um, that these combinations had, had dropped off in the, in the efficacy so much you cannot tell by looking. Okay, so I'm just going to do a quick explanation um, for, for people um, about the power of combinations. Um, it's also going to um, kind of give a bit of background as to how drench resistance develops. Um, and I quite often get asked, why don't we rotate drenches anymore? It's a little bit difficult concept sometimes to get your head around. Um, so I'm going to start here. Um, let's say this is the dawn of time on a sheep farm where there's no drenching being done ever before. So this might be back in the 70s. Um, someone's missed BZs and, and they've got uh, their first drum of levamazole. And this is the one worm in a million um, that has some sort of gene in it that enables it to be resistant to levamazole. So it's laying eggs. Some of them will have those genes as well. Um, but that's okay, because his 999,000 whatever mates are all laying susceptible eggs, that's fine. So, you know, what are the chances of this thing breeding up? Not very good. Um, and there's our grass out there. But then we drench with the Ramazole. So what happens then? We knock out all of those other worms um, that are susceptible to the Ramazole and we leave this guy behind, or female worm behind. So for the next... 21 to 28 days, um, the only um, eggs that go out into that pasture are ones that have survived that drench. But that's okay, right? Because in the beginning, there's all these other worm eggs out there and worm larvae out there um, that can kind of dilute that out. But, then it, but if we just keep going with the same chemical, what happens um, is we're just giving a competitive advantage all the time to the worms that are surviving, right? Um, because every time we're knocking out the non-resistant ones and bit by bit, um, we breed up these resistant ones. So that's fine. Um, I'm sure you probably all understood that anyway. Um, however, in this scenario, um, if right at the beginning, at the dawn of time, um, we had used a combination of drugs, um, knowing that one worm in a million might have 
a, a gene that enables it to survive labamazole and another worm in a million somewhere probably not in the same sheep might have a gene that enables it to survive the other drench the chances of those two genes first being present in the same sheep um, and being present in worms that are there at the same time to breed with each other is just infinitesimally tiny um, so if at the dawn of time um, we had been able to use combination drugs um, we possibly wouldn't be where we are now um, when we do that with our combination, we knock that one resistant one out, right? So he, she stops laying eggs and the whole cycle stops and that whole, sorry, that whole advantage um, to, the, to the resistant worms is gone. But that is not what happened, right? Um, so I just think this is really important to understand because we get asked this a lot is, you know, why are these combination drenches not working? You told us 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that if we used combinations, everything would be fine. Yeah, the whole, the whole power of a combination um, rests in the ability of each individual active to be highly effective um, against the worms that are out there. Um, but of course, with what I've just explained, um, what happened by the time we started using combinations is that, you know, BZs came in in the, in the early 60s, we used them for maybe a decade. Um, unknowingly, um, we were building up some genes for resistance to those worms, um, probably never saw them, um, you know, that, that was never a problem. Um, some resistance was measured, actually, incidentally, in the 70s, but no one worried about it. The Vamazole came along, we did the same thing. Um, you know, once you're starting to get some, some genes in the population um, for both, then you're getting the chance that out on the pasture, um, in, in the same bite that a, that a sheep's taking, are some worms that have got genes for both. And once they get eaten in the same bite by the same sheep, then they're in the sheep's gut together, and there's a chance that your two resistant worms are going to get together and shag, right? Um, so by the time we had um, drugs like Arrest and Matrix and things on the market, and um, we already had a, a level of these resistant worms that um, got together and bred, um, and, and we, so we were already not in a position where the drugs were highly um, efficacious right to begin with. So what was happening was we already had these combined um, genotypes in the worm population of, of double resistance that we didn't know about. They were there at a low level, but you know they were still getting a competitive advantage every time you used your arrest. So that was going on in the background, and then we changed to matrix or we changed to you know one of the other triple combinations. But yeah. We, we already had these, um, these levels of resistance in the background. And so on its own, um, the power of a combination to delay resistance hasn't been what the modeling and the, the science said it should have been. Um, but what we need to remember in New Zealand that is at, at the same time um, that this work on combinations was being proven, um, was that there was a whole lot of other science going on and, and had already gone on um, through a lot through ag research. The group at Flockhouse did a massive amount of work. Um, so, you know, there's all these other things, all these other things that we know about um, in terms of managing resistance and reducing resistance. And this stuff here on this screen is all out of the Wormwise manual, which has been around since the early 2000s or the mid 2000s. Um, and unfortunately, it's been too easy just to change what we purchase instead of changing what we practice. It's been really easy to change to using um, combination drenches. On a lot of farms, it's been very difficult to wean people off using long-acting products in the pre lamb period, and that has been shown in multiple very well-done trials that that is a risk uh, for drench resistance, and also the National Survey showed that. Um, um, docking treatment of ewes is actually a moderate risk factor. Um, buying sheep with resistant worms, massive risk factor if you're a lamb finisher. Um, using a single active, obviously I've already explained that. Um, and continued use of an ineffective product. Um, if you have not done a reduction test on your farm, you may well be in that situation. And that's a really big risk factor for making things worse. Um, yeah, so that's a bit of background. So not trying to scare you, but um, the superworm that, that 
multi-drug resistant worm um, potentially could already be on your farm. Um, talking to Dave Lethwick from Ag Research the other day, he said farmers keep ringing me and saying, you know what, I've, uh, I'm, I'm worried I've got drench resistance, what do I do? And he said the answer will be yes, you, you will have drench resistance, it just depends to what level. Um, so how are we going to figure this out on our farms as to what's here and what isn't? And for whatever reason, my presentation now doesn't want to move. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so how do we know our status? Um, we can launch in and do a, a full faecal egg count reduction test, um, which half of the farmers in here have done, so that's great. Um, and those of you who've done a reduction test will already know about drench checks, right? Um, which is you do your routine drench on a group of lambs or calves. Um, I've said day 8 to 12 after the drench, um, you take some samples and hopefully they've all got um, an egg count of zero. Um, I've said day 8 to 12 because a number of the products on the market do have a short period of persistency. Um, Moni Pantel has persistency of um, maybe four or five days. Um, so does Abamectin um, in worms that aren't um, resistant. <laughs> um, so we're just trying to get around that. Um, but if you do them at day seven, that's fine. Um, if you do them at day 12, that's fine. If you leave them too much longer than that, um, you do run the risk that in the odd case, there is like one or two cases in the literature of one or two worm species being able to produce, um, to, to get through a sheep and um, make itself into an adult worm and lay eggs again within sort of 14 days. But I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, just do it is, is the um, message here in terms of, and it's just something that you should be doing on an annual basis um, or more than annual basis sometimes with your routine drenches. Um, the reason I say more than annual is because different worm species predominate at different times of the year. So um, with your weaning drench, um, particularly in your cooler climates, you may be well dominated at that point by Ostatalia. So your drench check at that time will reflect um, more, you know, what Ostatalia are surviving your drench. Whereas you roll through now uh, to the end, no, not now, but into the end of autumn, sort of um, April, May, if you've still got young animals on the farm that are being drenched. Um, by that time, your sheep, um, trichostrongolus, are likely to be very predominant. Um, and a, a, a drench check at that time is, is going to be more a reflection of what's going on with your trikes. Um, so just doing it once a year um, may not be enough. So that's drench checks. Um, we're going to pop up Jenny, an we've got a here. question there. Sorry, Ginny. Sure. We'll just jump back. So Harry's chucked a question in here, which is probably relevant there. But in areas where we have hard winters and dormant growth over that period, how important is monitoring worm resistance when we're only carrying the lambs for three to four months? So really in high country scenarios. That's a really great question. Um, the... The power of a cold winter to completely knock out all the life cycle stages um, on the pasture um, is not as much as you imagine, um, particularly with trichostrongolus. Um, that can survive the formation of ice crystals and the thawing of ice crystals in its body on a number of cycles before it, the, those L3 larvae actually start to die off. Um, work at Otago University has shown that. Um, and I do, I do hear people say, calling trikes winter trikes sometimes. Um, and I think that might be part of it. They're better at surviving um, sort of cooler, wet conditions and even frosts. Um, and, you know, if you're thinking that because you live in an area that gets a lot of frosts and snow, um, you know, one of the coldest areas um, in the North Island that gets the most snow um, in, in the central North Island area, um, you know, we've managed to measure, um, Anthony Oswald from Taipei has reported some pretty scary levels of drench resistance um, in, in his sheep flocks there. Um, so just having snow and frost isn't enough to, to make you immune from getting drench resistance. Um, the other thing about cold winters is that they can be a little bit like droughts in terms of if, if you do get a big larva die off um, over that cold winter and, and you don't have sheep um, on that high country area um, over that time, 
Um, you then come into spring with very low, potentially much lower levels of larvae on the pasture, so therefore less worms in refugia, um, meaning that there are less of those unselected worms out there on the pasture to potentially dilute anything that's coming out the back end of a, a drenched lamb later on the next summer. I hope that makes sense. I'm trying not to be too complex about it, but um, yeah, if you really do have very long cold winters that, um, that do knock out a lot of worms, then you've almost got to treat your um, treat that area almost like a crop or a new grass the next season if it if it's had a long time with no sheep grazing on it and no worms. Right, okay, so I've got an example here, um, and this uh, we're hoping to move you into breakout rooms to do a little exercise and discuss this. Um, so this is a real life example from one of my clients in the Central North Island. Um, this was a drench check on it's it is a drench check, um, but you just note the date up there or the, the time frame up there, um, that was done on some lambs last autumn. Um, and you'll see those faecal egg counts down there. Um, so, um, but my questions are, um, number one, looking at this drench check, do you think that this is a problem? And then what would you do next? Cool. Okay, so I did put a wee fish hook in there, which was that um, people had been away in this situation and um, the the FEC check, um, the drench check was a little bit late. Um, it was, um, but that said, um, there is no way uh, that in a space of 14 days that even um, some of those species that can whip around a bit more quickly like Cuperia, um, there is no way that you would develop egg counts um, in the thousands like this um, and in the high, higher hundreds like this 750 um, within 14 days. So. So these, these, um, these worms or these eggs have to have come out of um, animals that survived that switch. Um, if I was just looking at this for the first time and I knew nothing about the farm, um, I would definitely be going back, um, looking at, you know, who drenched the lambs? Was the drench gun working? Was it delivering the dose um, that it said it was, i.e. actually calibrate the gun? Um, and just get a whole lot more background information like that. Um, however, this is a farm I've been working with for a while, um, and we did already suspect that there was a problem. Um, so, you know, knowing that these worms were probably, we knew these worms were probably surviving switch. Um, the other interesting thing in this scenario was that the, this is a finishing farm. Um, there was another mob of lambs um, in a paddock nearby that had been drenched with Zolvix at the same time, and the manager was noticing quite a difference um, in the, in the look of the lambs between the two groups. Um, so what did we do? Um, got straight in here um, and drenched these with um, a novel active. I'm presuming at that time it was Zolvix um, because there's no way that you want to keep um, contaminating your nice area of Lucerne um, with uh, these multi-drug resistant worms. Um, you would then check that Zolvix seven days or seven to 10 to 12 days later uh, to make sure that that had worked as well. Um, because that's not something you want to assume. Um, and then, you know, looking ahead, um, you know, make a plan to do a proper fecal egg count reduction test in, in the right time of the season. Um, I've managed to cut the date off this, um, but this was later in the autumn. Um, so getting too late to do a reduction test. Um, and the other thing that we would do here is um, send these fecal samples away to the lab for what's called a larval culture. Um, so these eggs are growing up in medium at the lab um, and hatched out and grown into larvae, which can be identified to see which, um, which worm species it is that's surviving this drench. And on most farms that I deal with, it's more than one now. Um, if I got in this situation a massive mix of worm species when I did a larval culture on something like this, it would be more, I would know that it was more likely that someone had messed up drenching these animals. Um, when you get um, positive egg counts after a drench, um, it's typically only one or two species. So your larval culture will come back with one or two species. If your larval culture comes back with the broad spectrum of species, it means that someone threw the drench drum in the dam or um, <laughs> or the, the gun wasn't working or um, yeah, someone um, let those lambs out or whatever. Um, so that's a good way of doing a bit of a reality check as to what's going on. So that's drench checks. Right, um, the next 
the next uh, rung in the ladder in terms of figuring out what you've got going on as a reduction test and half of you have done these already so I won't labour the point too much and you can all read. Um, but the reduction test is more detailed. Um, it involves collecting faecal egg counts at the beginning um, so you know what the level of egg output was on the day that you drenched. Uh, the lambs or calves then all get drenched with the different action families, so BZ, Levamazole, Ivermectin and whatever combinations um, we think uh, for your farm would be appropriate. Um, we then come back at that normal time frame. Um, each group that had the different drench gets the egg counts taken um, and then we're able to calculate um, by how much did each drench reduce the egg count for each group of lambs um, and then we're able to um, give you an efficacy figure um, and it's really important that these efficacy figures are worked out for each worm species. Um, the overall reduction while the, the, the technical definition of a reduction test is that a drench has passed if um, more than, if, if it reduces the egg counts by more than 95% overall, um, that can actually hide um, some problems going on with individual species, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so this... Oh, so you share your this. screen again, please, Janae. Actually, while you're doing that, Rachel had a question here. Are there... Um, are the only reasons for a larval culture to rule out someone is not drenching properly? Um, no, not at all. Um, it, when we're doing those drench checks, um, that's kind of our first piece of information um, if, if we're getting positive um, counts. Um, but also I do a lot of larval cultures through the season on, on farms that will let me um, to know uh, what species are predominating um, in lambs. Gosh, that, this is just about the subject for another whole um, session on actually on, on farm worm management, um, particularly in our environment and in the South Island as Barber's Pole starts to march south, um, is, is knowing um, when the Barber's Pole challenge is really starting to come on. Um, and for me, um, doing some Barber's Pole monitoring quite early by doing larval cultures, um, sort of even pre-weaning and around about weaning um, in, in our flocks gives us some kind of indication as to how quickly the Barber's Pole challenge is ramping up. Um, and, and that may be useful for other worm species as well. Um, and aside from larval cultures, there's some really cool new technology coming soon um, around staining eggs um, and being able to identify them by their DNA with a stain, um, which will speed this whole thing up because larval cultures take two weeks. Um, and this, um, it's called a leptin binding assay, um, is going to be able to identify um, Barber's Pole eggs in faecal samples in 48 hours. Um, so that's going to be really cool. That's something to look forward to. I hope I answered your question. Okay, um, so when we've done our reduction test, um, at the very base level, it's a guide to which drenches you can continue to use safely. Um, you know, knowing that those that your drench efficacy could be as low as 50% before you actually start seeing it visually, um, you know, that's important. Um, and it's also knowing which combinations you can continue to use safely. Um, I, I do come across a lot of farms that are still using double combinations, and I'll, I'll show you an example in a minute um, where that, even though the double's working well, um, there's some big, big stuff going on in the background. Um, it's a warning system for products and practices that you might need to start avoiding. Um, and, you know, at, at, its, at its more scary end, it becomes a call to action for making some changes to your system. Um, yeah, so farm systems that are highly, highly dependent on drench to keep them propped up, um, and that includes, um, you know, long-acting uh, products and things like that. Um, you know, once you're getting into these levels of drench resistance that we're starting to see on some farms, um, really um, the question is not which drenches can I continue to use, but what do I need to do with my farm system to make this system more resilient um, and, and not be... Um, going to completely tip over with drench resistance. Um, we do have examples in the North Island now um, of lambs dying in the autumn of triple resistant worms um, within sort of two weeks of having been drenched. Um, so it is a real thing. Okay, I'm really sorry about this, <laughs> but for those of you who've already done a reduction test, 
Um, I'm hoping that you'll be able to make head and tail of this slide. Um, this is a recent um, this is a recent reduction test from um, one of my clients. Um, it's in the Manawatu. Um, and these, uh, just for those of you who haven't seen this kind of thing before, I'll just try and explain it a little bit so you know what you're looking at when you go into your breakout rooms. Um, each drenched family is, goes along on the rows. Um, so we've got white drench, BZ drench along there. And then the efficacy of white drench over all is 92%. Um, but then when we break it down to the species level after doing these larval cultures, these are the individual efficacies for each species. So nematode iris there, 71%. That's not cool. But however, white drench is killing all the barber's pole, so that's good. It's killing 99% of the Ostertagia, which in the North Island, that's actually pretty good. Um, and Trichostrongolus, um, only 77%. Um, and then I can't see my cuperia out there because my chat box is there. But um, yeah, cuperia is 100%. So that, that's how it works. Um, clear drench, you know, the overall reduction, that's a failure. 99% um, overall for the abamectin. Um, and then when we drill into the various species, um, it's not too bad. Um, some pretty good efficacies along here by, by standards of, of other farms I see. Um, but then we come down here um, to this double combination. It has just passed, right? Whoops, sorry, I'll go back. It's just passed um, on an overall, but you can see some things going on here. Um, and then the triple looking pretty good along here. So I've probably answered some of the questions for you. Um, I hope that what I've explained here has made enough sense. So, I mean, I've already answered some of my questions. My questions were, um, which, of, which of them have passed over all? Um, and if you're using that 95% cutoff, then the abamectin, the double and the triple um, at an overall reduction level appear to have passed. I often hear farmers talking about, you know, what, um, what their reduction was overall, um, but this can actually hide some big problems. Um, and a good example here is this um, double combination drench, um, where it's leaving behind um, a large chunk of the nematode iris, um, and also um, it's becoming less effective um, against trichostrongolus. Um, also up here, our clear drench, which is a, a part of that combination, right? Again, this nematode iris here is not being well controlled. Um, and also we've got a bit of a problem with trichostrongolus. Um, so this is where we need to kind of drill down to. And this is not something I would expect most farmers to either want to do themselves or, or to need to do themselves. Like this is where your, your good... Um, advisor should come in and really help you with this. Um, and this is why for this client, this, this is where I've highlighted these things, um, that we've got our big problem worms on this farm are this nematode iris, which has basically got some resistance to everything, um, including, um, you know, the triple combination is not working perfectly, um, just because it's 97%. When you see the individual efficacies under here, um, I wouldn't call this a tick. This is not a tick. Um, and then we've also got a trichostrongolus that even though the triple is working well, thank goodness for the abamectin here, this is a bit of an unusual picture. Um, the reason we chose these drenches on this farm um, was because this farm has a real long history of only using double combination drenches. Um, I would normally have ivermectin in here as well. Um, but it is really important to get down to the species level to find out what's going on because these overall efficacies can mask um, monsters lurking underneath, if you like. Um, so my other question for this one is, um, can this farm continue to use a triple? Um, and the answer is yes, but we need to keep a watching brief on this nematode iris. Um, and that becomes another whole conversation about when does that worm predominate? Um, what, um, what classes of stock is it predominating in? And is it really a problem? Um, but that, that would be an individual conversation with that farm. So that's a reduction test and having a crack at interpreting it. Um, so there's these other things that could be talked about, but I'm going to leave it there and we could do another session sometime. Thanks, Jenny. That's awesome. We actually have a few questions and I think we can dive into those. I've got one from earlier uh, from Rob, I think, um, which was, why not a Zolbix and a StarTech in a combination? 
That's a really great question. Um, and at the moment, both um, Zolvix and StarTech have abamectin in them. So with young lambs, you would be giving young lambs a double dose of abamectin, and abamectin um, at, at more than the recommended dose can be toxic. Um, so I would be, if I was in a situation where I thought I needed to use both of those together, i.e., maybe make coming a quarantine drench from a farm that I already knew with Zolvix resistance. And then we've got three to four farms um, that Ag Research have confirmed um, do have Zolvix resistance. Um, so if I was needing to clean out a Zolvix resistant worm like that, I would give my Zolvix on one day and my StarTech the next day or vice versa, but I wouldn't give them at the same time. Um, but you'll never get those two chemicals put together in a combination at the moment because those two actives are owned by different companies. Hey, um, so we also had emailed a couple of questions, Ginny. Um, one of them was the difference between the Centromax capsules and Bionic capsules um, as there's a big difference in the price. I can't comment on the technical um, or chemical um, basis to either of those products. Um, because I don't have the information um, and I also don't know the basis of the pricing. Um, Long-acting products in the pre land period are a well-established um, means of making a resistance situation worse. Um, and I'll stop there, <laughs> but I, I can't answer that, sorry. Can I, just, can I just add one thing to that, is that yep. there is a paper, a paper published in the Sheep and Beef Vets um, proceedings from a couple of years back by Richard Hilson at Vet Services in Hawke's Bay, who did a big monitoring project on their farms that were using um, long-acting capsules in the pre land period. Um, and there did seem to be a difference on a very limited number of data um, on the leakage out of Bionics versus Centromax, um, in that the Centromax ones tended to have higher egg counts, but I wouldn't hang anything on that because there may well have been individual farm factors in there that they already had higher levels of resistance or whatever. Um, but the main finding in that survey, and I'd encourage anyone to look for it and read it or ask the vet to give them a copy, is that nearly all of the farms with both Bionics and Centromax and long-acting um, Moxidectin, um, most of those farms had worms leaking out when they shouldn't have been. Okay, cool. Um, next one, Jimmy, is the pros and cons of using a capsule versus a long-acting injection for set stocking? Uh, <laughs> um, anyone who knows me will know that I don't advocate for long-acting injections and, or, or capsules and that I advocate for um, nitrogen in feed budgets and getting your, your grass right. Um, but in saying that, um, the bionic capsule obviously has two actives in it. And if on your farm you know um, that both of those two actives are highly effective, um, then theoretically the bionic should be more, protect more protective against resistance because you're using a combination. However, on most farms you either don't know or you know that in particular often that white component of the bionic is pretty ineffective. Uh, therefore, the protective effect of using a combination in that role is probably very minimal and you may be actually dually selecting for both there. Um, the long-acting injection, um, it is only, it's a single active, right? So um, the Wormwise principles, one, say don't uh, avoid the use of long-acting products pre lamb and two, um, avoid the use of single actives. So you've got two crosses against that product. Um, the other thing with those long-acting injections is that they have a, um, they allow trichostrongolus to predominate um, because they only control trichostrongolus for somewhere in the range of 35 to 45 days. Um, and as long as the other species aren't resistant to that drug, um, they control the other species for much longer. Um, Non-resistant ostatagia will be controlled by that injection for over 100 days. It's at least 112 days. Um, but in some monitoring I did here a few seasons back, um, I think we did 12 farms in my practice that were using long-acting injections and only one of them um, did not have resistant ostatagia leaking through um, in somewhere in the range of day 65 to 85. So um, those products are leaking as well. 
Cool, thanks, Janine. We'll just take a couple more um, questions, just mindful we've got to keep moving. So, um, Kurt's question, do the withholds change if farmers choose to use two drenches at the same time? Oh, I hate that, that question. I don't hate the question. I hate the fact that it should be a question. Um, we have had some advice um, from the ACVM group, which is the Agricultural Compounds and Veterinary Medicines group, that if you simultaneously um, administer, not simultaneously in that double drench gun that they've got in Taihapi, um, but even if you are administering them, you know, within the same kind of hour on the same day, um, that that is considered to be off-label use and then you are into a default withholding period of 91 days for meat. Mm. Um, there's no science to back up that the withholds should be any different. Um, but that is what we are being told. Cool, thank you. Um, a good one from Leslie. What's the best way to get clean pastures? So just, yeah. Okay, um, best way to get clean pastures is, is berry. Um, so that really, um, because there's, um, there's a few larvae in the top centimetres of soil. Um, so if, if you're really wanting to be squeaky, squeaky clean, ploughing's the best. However, we know from a lot of practical experience and monitoring that um, any, any system that you use to take out um, an old native pasture and replace it with um, a crop or a new grass or whatever, um, that process of, even if it's a double spray desiccate and direct drill, um, you massively, massively drop um, the level and egg, pop, egg um, level um, that's left on that paddock. Um, so any type of pasture renewal is great. Um, the, and, and it's a bit like removing weeds from a paddock, right? You know, the more crop cycles that you go through, the more weeds you, re you remove. Um, so those kind of um, double brassica systems that is designed to get weeds out of your paddocks are also really good um, at removing a whole lot more larvae than, say, a double spray and direct drill. Um, I hope that was what you were wanting. Um, it, cleaning up by using um, cross grazing with other species, um, that takes many, many months, if not even um, years, to really, really clean a place up. Um, but if, if you're talking about providing, um, say, clean earth feed for lambs or calves, um, you really kind of need to be grazing in the quantum of three to six months with another species. So, for instance, like uh, finishing winter lambs on a, on a block that's had bulls on it all summer, that kind of thing. It's not just four weeks or six weeks or, or two months. It's a lot longer than that. Perfect. That's great. Thanks, Ginny. Um, that was an awesome presentation and hopefully everyone's enjoyed it. What we might get is, Ginny, those questions that um, we haven't had time to run through, if you could possibly jump through some answers into the chat box, it'll keep things moving along there as there is a few um, unanswered ones. But now um, we'll invite Dr. Cara Brosnahan from Beef and Lamb New Zealand um, to share her screen and we'll um, step through the second part of the presentation. Um, so I'm Cara Brosnahan, a scientist in the research team here at Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Um, and my focus of my role here is animal health. So internal parasites is a big part of that and also facial eczema. So I'll just be talking about um, the internal parasite research we've got going on at the moment and what we're thinking about for the future. But before I do that, I just thought I'd take the opportunity to um, introduce what the research team does and who is a part of it. So we identify research needs in partnership with farmers. So this is through um, things like the UMR survey, um, through the farmer councils, through the conference or through extension managers. And also um, we have a farmer research advisory group that we regularly keep in touch with. And then these research needs are aligned with the Beef and Lamb New Zealand strategy. We design, lead and manage research projects. So we are involved in the technical detail right from the start and throughout tracking the progress of the project, but also the quality of it so that we can um, be sure that our investment is worthwhile. We work with other scientists to deliver this research um, and I'll be talking about some of those um, people soon. And one of the most important parts is to communicate the research findings. And this is an area we're looking into as well to see how we can improve this and actually um, evaluate some of the impact of these communication methods um, to see if it is actually causing um, or 
making farmers uptake some of this research. So we support a wide range of different areas of research, um, obviously animal health, and then we have um, the genetics arm, but also all of these other areas. And we have a team of people doing this um, to make sure all of this research happens. Um, so I won't go through everyone in the interest of time, um, but just so you get some faces to names if you see them. Um, so talking about our internal parasite research, just go through a couple of projects that are recently completed and then a couple of projects that we've um, got still going on. So Jenny talked a bit about long-acting products and this was one of the projects that was completed last year that was led by Dave Lethwick at Ag Research. And this was looking at body condition score in response to pre-mating treatment with these long-acting products. So it was injection and capsules. And what was seen was that there was a temporary benefit in the use with a lower body condition score that were treated, but this didn't persist and those untreated, um, or the animals not treated with these long-acting products caught up pretty quickly. What was also found is that treated ewes did give birth to more lambs, but by weaning, there was actually no difference between the groups. So the financial gain came in from ensuring lamb survival rather than actually um, administering these long-acting drench products. And as Ginny said, these are um, provide a high risk of drench resistance. So it's just about understanding if you are using them, what the potential risks and benefits are. There was also um, in this work, they looked at the microbiome and if there were any differences between the treated and non-treated animals. And it was shown that there were some differences, but because this was the first study of its kind, it's unknown what these differences mean. And it does mean though that this work can be used as a basis for other research to happen. Uh, just to jump in there, can you yeah, define sure. a, a microbiome? Oh, sorry. So that is the bacteria in the gut of the animal. So, um, there's obviously lots of bacteria within the gut and the drench products are not specific just for parasites. They may also kill the bacteria and fungi that are in there. So they were looking at um, what changes are in the, in the gut flora essentially and could this actually um, have a difference in animal health long term. Yeah, perfect. Um, and the next project was in cattle and looking at how well a drench product actually got into the parasites in the gut and looking at three different application methods. So looking at a poron, um, oral drench and injection. And it was found that for different parasite species, the different application method um, was, yeah, so for most parasite species, oral drench was the best at getting the ivermectin to the parasites. But for Ostatagia ostatagi, it was actually injection. So again, this is just really good information for farmers and vets to know when they're making parasite management plans um, to again know the potential risks and benefits of different application methods. And a couple of studies that are ongoing. Um, one is a case study on a wire wrapper finishing farm. And this is led by Inside New Zealand with technical help from Andrew Dowling at PGD Wrightson and Dave Lethwick again at Ag Research. And this was comparing um, introducing refugia, so those susceptible parasites onto the finishing farm and comparing it with quarantine drenching the stock coming onto the farm to see if that would improve the triple drench resistance status. So the cool thing about this project is that the breeders and finishers are working together. So there was about 25 participants in the study. They all got a um, faecal count reduction test and they shared their results so that everyone knew it, when they were buying product onto their farm, then they knew what parasites they were bringing onto their farm so they could make these informed parasite management decisions. So we liken it to a wheel of parasites. If you don't actually know what you're buying and what this resistant status of the stock you're bringing onto your farm is, it's a bit of a gamble um, and you can't really make those parasite management decisions. So by knowing what you're getting, you could potentially introduce refugia if you have a um, resistance issue. And this is what this farm did. 
And the early results show that there is some improvement in the resistant status on the finishing farm, but it has still got um, about a year and a half to go. So we'll have to wait until the end of the study to actually see if those results continue on. And the final project I'll talk about is um, the communication. So we are looking at creating impact through communication and we're using parasite management as a case study. So we're comparing five different communication methods, an animated video, the Wormwise Drench poster, a Seen and Heard podcast, which is three farmers talking about how they farm with triple drench resistance, the Wormwise workshops and the Wormwise e-learning module. So we've engaged Scarlatti to help us out with this project and they've created an impact model, which essentially forecasts the change that will occur from a particular communication method. And these communication methods are also compared against each other to see which one is um, more effective. And obviously to see if the impact of the communication is a good investment. So we're using surveys to inform this model. We had an initial online survey, which assessed the reach of all these communication methods, and also to see what the baseline practice of farmers is out there. And we'll have a follow-up survey in, at the end of this month, and that's gonna look and see if any of these communication methods actually caused someone to change anything about their parasite management practice or plan. So the goal is to understand what communication channel actually supported change. And we'll use this information for research projects going forward um, to invest in those areas that worked well and maybe drop back on some of those areas that didn't work as well, or if there's something better we could be doing. So looking at the future, so we'll be continuing with um, putting out resources for education and communication. So the podcasts, um, as resources permit, we will try to do more of those um, and media releases. So this is an example of a, one, a media release that was put out a couple of months ago, jointly with Ag Research, and just the importance of quarantine drenching and using the right products for quarantine drenching um, in the face of this increasing drench resistance around the country. And looking to the future, we are um, in the research team looking at our strategy for what are the future needs of parasite management. So the main thing we're thinking about is what research is needed to help farmers farm with minimal or no drench. With these drenches failing um, more often than not, and um, you know, consumer demand of wanting less input into the animals, how do we actually help farmers achieve this? And maintain the drenches that we have available so that when we need them, they actually work. And um, the other thing we're thinking about is whether we can put all of this research and case studies together in um, an operational workflow. So something that a resource that you could go to, to if you've got a result that you had drench resistance, you can actually see there is a pathway to um, improve and farm with it, obviously in consultation with your advisors. And um, looking at whether there could be an alternative test for faecal egg count reduction test. We know it's quite a blunt tool and there is a lot of variability. So if improvements could be made there, um, we'd like to investigate that. And just lastly, to let you know, there is a summary of all the projects um, that we invest in, the current ones and the ones that are recently completed on the research webpage. So if you um, are interested, you can go there. And there's also a contact person for each of the projects. So if you want more information, you can always reach out. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Cara. That's awesome. And um, yeah, um, thanks very much, guys, for your um, input this evening, Ginny. I think we've already had heaps of comments to say you're on the um, right on the nail um, with your topics as well. So I think we definitely probably need to do something again in the future. So um, yeah, perfect. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Briar, for your behind the scenes and Cara for your update. Um, that was great. So thanks, everyone. We'll um, catch you again.